everyone. Watch till the end of the video for a surprise. I'll see you there. Back in 2014, I went on a camping trip with my girlfriend at that time, Brooklyn. We had this planned out for a few months, saving up all we could as we didn't make a lot of money. We actually worked at the same place at that time. I helped her get a job where I worked because it made more than what she had at her previous job and we could carpool, saving some money on gas. However, getting the time off you want was hard to do due to how scheduling worked. So, when we managed to find a few days off together, we took advantage of it. We were long overdue for some time off together anyways. Unfortunately, it wouldn't go as planned. We wouldn't get to use this time to distress, unwind, and enjoy our time together. Something came up within her family, putting her in a bad mindset, as well as some changes at work, changing things for both of us in terms of how we were going to get paid. This caused more stress on us, especially her, so we were already on edge when it came time for our trip. We both loved camping, but we were far from professionals, I suppose you could say. We had a decent tent that fit both of us comfortably, and we had a cooler where we put some quick and easy food and drinks in, but we usually ended up going somewhere to eat at least once. Then, we also brought fishing poles and other little camping essentials to make the trip fun and memorable. The day before we left, some more stuff happened with our family, and I asked if we needed to cancel our plans. Where we were going, we had to pay for our campground reservation, and there were no refunds if you canceled. As mentioned, we loved camping but preferred campgrounds, so we at least had things there in case we forgot something. And of course, having physical restrooms were great too. So, it would have been disappointing having to cancel and lose that money, but I would rather her be comfortable and happy due to the circumstances. Anyways, she declined and said that she still wanted to go especially given the reservation plan, so we still went as planned. We got to the campgrounds, which was about an 8-hour drive, and then set up our tent. The night seemed to go really well. There was a family of five in the lot next to us that came over and said hi, and offered us food, but we declined as Brooke wanted to go to a place that we drove by on the way there. After we returned, we set up our chairs and went fishing for a while. She seemed very happy at that time, talking, joking, and taking pictures of our catches. The next day was even fun. We went to a nearby hiking trail, and she found all kinds of things to take back with us that she liked to collect, like rocks, deformed flowers or leaves, things like that. At one point, we even stopped to use the restroom, when a guy came up and was pretty much flirting with me. I'm a girl as well, so it was always funny when one of us would walk up to the other and hug or something and watched as the other flirter would scurry away embarrassed. So, it wasn't until later that night that we would run into problems. Even though rain wasn't expected all weekend, Clouds quickly formed and darkened the sky. She was worried that we were going to get rained out, and we didn't have a tarp or anything for the top of the tent, so she was talking about packing it up. I was trying to be optimistic and telling her that it was just cloudy and it wouldn't rain, but sure enough, it did. It wasn't a storm, and it wasn't long, but... We just sat in the car waiting for it to stop. We didn't have enough time to take down the tent either, so she was understandably upset about losing several hours of being able to do anything, but also that our tent was going to be soaked 
and probably impossible to sleep in. When it finally stopped, we went to assess the damage and to our surprise, the outside was definitely wet, but the inside was just a little damp. We actually bought a few beach towels, so I started wiping up the tent and set our sleeping bags out on the back of my truck to dry some. It only seemed to get worse as the night progressed, though. She seemed to get mad about other random things, typically small things like not being able to get the fire started and things like that. I knew she was going through a lot, so I didn't get mad at her. I just tried to do what I could to make her happy. However, when it was about time for us to go to sleep, or at least go to our tent and quiet down, she was not having it. She complained it was too hot and that the tent was still wet and was just mad at everything that I tried to do or say. Finally, she said what I was expecting all day, which was that she wanted to leave. However, it's now 9 or 10 at night and it's dark. Too dark to scramble around to pick everything up, take down the tent and then drive home because we definitely couldn't afford a hotel. I told her that we could leave tomorrow, only losing a day of our paid lot but there was no way that we were going to be able to do it all tonight safely. She didn't like my suggestion, so she told me that I could sleep in the tent and she went to sleep in the truck. I knew her well enough that it wasn't worth fighting her, so I watched as she took the keys and went into the darkness towards the truck. I laid there in the tent annoyed as well and read for a bit before falling asleep. I was hopeful that she might come back in, so I wanted to be awake if she did, but she never showed up while I was awake. However, at some point in the night, she must have changed her mind. I was facing towards the tent wall, laying perpendicular to the entrance. So, when I heard her stepping around and slowly unzipping the tent, I pretended to be asleep, so she didn't feel obligated to say something and to hopefully avoid any further arguments. She then quietly crawled into the tent and laid down. I assumed she was facing away from me, as she did when she was mad at me, because she didn't hug me or hold me like she usually did, which was fine because at least I knew she was in there with me. And after a few minutes of her shifting a bit, and not saying anything, I just fell asleep none the wiser. The next morning, I woke up to an empty tent. I just figured that she wanted to get up and start prepping to leave. Or maybe she was going to make breakfast for us, or some other morning ritual we did. But when I got out, she was nowhere to be found. I was a bit curious, so my first thought was to check the truck. And sure enough, she was in there and still asleep. I tried the doors, but of course, they were still locked, so I knocked on the window, waking her up. She seemed to be in a decent mood, though, telling me good morning and poking fun, asking if I got wet at all. After the jokes and her opening the door, I asked her when she went back to the truck, and she looked confused. She asked me what I meant by that, so I repeated my question, mentioning how I knew she went to the tent because I had woken up to it. But she seemed confused and alarmed as she told me, I never went in the tent last night. That's when I started looking confused. She had to have gone to the tent as I heard it being unzipped and I could feel another person entering it. The color seemed to drain from her face as she repeated and was adamant that it wasn't her. In fact, she said she thought that I was trying to get in the truck because she heard someone pulling on the handle, and I confirmed that it wasn't me either. She said that she locked the doors and when she heard it, she yelled to go away thinking it was me. 
But when she heard what sounded like someone taking off running, she looked around but didn't see anything or anyone. So we talked a little more on the timeline of things, and it seemed like it was probably within an hour or so of us going to bed that the events occurred. We looked around the truck and the lot to see if we saw anything, and to our surprise, we found some shoe prints around the back of the truck that were not from us and several food wrappers from the lunch meat and chips that we had brought. We even asked the family that was by us if they were around our stuff or if they saw anything and they said that they were all asleep. Needless to say, we were both pretty well terrified and no longer felt safe staying there. Who tried getting into my truck, and who slept in the same tent as me? I was thankful that Brooke locked the doors, so they couldn't get in. But this person was also brazen enough to open my tent after seeing someone in there, and then continue to enter it. What if I had woken up and saw them? Would they have tried to do something to me? Those thoughts terrified me. We packed up all of our stuff, told that family why we were leaving, and to be careful when they went to bed. The mom seemed pretty worried about it, and rightfully so as they had three kids with them. And I still hope that nothing happened to them. After we left, we decided to go to a nearby museum and a cute little local diner before heading home. Our relationship didn't survive, but we are all still friends and still work together. So this was often brought up when we talked about trips and creepy things that happened to us. However, we still don't have any answers. The thoughts of those what-if situations are always terrifying, but for the most part, it's become a weird who got a free meal and free one-night stay on us. Story by you slash Supernova Mulesy It happened during summer vacation when I was 11. Me and my parents always go to South India for at least one month to see the family. During the whole month of June, there is what we call in our little village, the Mango Festival. It's a religious festival where divinity statues are exhibited in parades. There is also a large alley filled all along with small temporary stands where people can buy lots of different stuff like street food, fruits, toys, clothes, and more at very cheap prices. My mom and I always go to these little stores in the evening at like 5 or 6 when it's already dark because going during daytime is just too exhausting with the unbearable heat plus the crowd. And at that time, the alley is still very bright, enlightened by the stores and the decorative lights. That day, my mom decided to stop at a shoe or flip-flop stand to buy me some pears. The seller proceeded to show my mom the collections, and when he noticed my presence, he just locked his eyes on me. At the beginning, it did not bother me that much, and I just thought that I might look like someone he knew. But he kept staring at me the whole time. He knew exactly the time to stare at me. When my mom was looking at my direction, he stops and then he stares back again when she looks away. It was obvious at that point, and it made me very uncomfortable. Eventually, we had to leave without buying anything, but the seller insisted that we should come tomorrow because he had a new shipment or whatever new collections arriving. Two days after, my mom called me to go to the festival stands, but... I was reluctant to go with her this time. I told her that I was genuinely tired and I didn't want to. But she yelled at me saying that I am always lazy and wasting my summer vacation by staying at home all day. 
So I went with her. Our first stop was at the cheap jewelry store. Then, my mom made me do something that I always hated. But she did that all the time in order to help me with my shyness. She said, Take my purse and go to the shoe stand by yourself and buy a pair that you like. I will be watching you from here. I refused at first, but she progressively raised her voice. And to avoid being humiliated in front of other kids, I did what she said. When he saw me approaching his stand, he welcomed me with his unsettling smile. He proceeded to show all the new sandals, as I was his only customer, and he even took the time to put the sandals on me one by one, asking if it fits well. At that point, I just took whatever freaking shoe just to get out there quickly, and now it was the time for the checkout. I was, and I still am, stressed to order or talk to a vendor. I used to stutter a lot during these social situations, but this time it was different. It was not only stress, but there was also this fear and this gut feeling saying that this man is strange and that I shouldn't be here with him alone. I handed him the money, and I was waiting for my change. But his demeanor suddenly changed. He became fidgety and showed frustration over the cash register. He then said that the cash register broke for some unknown reason and that it wouldn't open. I glanced outside to see if my mom was still watching me. She was still observing, and when we made eye contact, she made a gesture with her hand telling me to hurry. She was observing at an angle, and as I was next to the cash register at the corner, I could not see her properly anymore. At the same time, the seller told me that he had another cash register in his trailer. He then took my money and went to his trailer. It was a sort of open shop so you could see his trailer if you are right in front of the shop. He went inside for a long time. I could hear voices of another person inside. They were talking, but I could not get what they were talking about. So for like 10 minutes, I was just standing there, waiting awkwardly and peeking back at my mom, occasionally to notice her of my presence at the checkout. Then, another client entered the shop and was looking at the merchandise. She asked me where the vendor is, and I told her that he was in the trailer. At the sound of our conversation, the vendor peeked from the trailer window and said to the woman, We don't take any more clients, ma'am. We're closing soon. The woman left soon after. It seemed strange that he had decided to close so suddenly and so early. It was only 6 p.m., and usually the shops closed late at 8 or even 9. I couldn't leave. I was still waiting to get my change back when the vendor peeked from his trailer's window and said that he finally managed to get my change. Then, he made a sign with his hand, as if to say to get inside. I was unsure about what he wanted, so I said nothing and waited where I was awkwardly. After a short moment, he peeked back and said, You can come now. I was confused. Why couldn't he just come outside and give my change back? And why the hell did he took so much time? I didn't say anything. Instead, I peeked back outside to see my mom. And when she saw my concerned face, she finally decided to come and help me. I said to the seller, Actually, I'm waiting for my mom. When my mother entered the shop, the seller got out of his trailer almost immediately and handed my change back. He was not frustrated anymore but smiling and very talkative. He even asked my mom if we were from here, to what she responded that we were from France and were spending the summer vacation in her hometown. My mom and I went to the other shops, but I could still see other clients coming to the shoe shop 
even though he said he was going to be closed soon. And by the time that my mom finished her shopping, it was 8 p.m., and on our way back, I could still see lights from his shop. And when we got closer, I could even see that he was using the same cash register that was supposed to be broken. At that age, I didn't realize how creepy this whole thing was. It just seemed odd and awkward. And years later, I finally realized that his gaze, his behavior, and his touches were all so, so wrong. And at that night, I bet his intentions were even worse. Luckily, that night was the last time that I ever saw him. During the festival of the following year, I couldn't find his stand anymore, and the slot was occupied by a street food stand. So yeah, creepy shoe seller, let's never meet, please. Story by you slash Aaron B666 For those who are outside the UK, Pontins is sort of a cheap and cheerful holiday park for families, with parks, water activities, and entertainment. It is nothing fancy, but I love the times that I went there as a kid. Anyway, I was 8 years old, so 15 years ago now and I was staying there with my mom, dad, and little sister. One night, we went to their daily evening entertainment. This is where families sit and eat, and then they'll be something like a magician or entertainer for kids, usually followed by music and dancing. All in all, good harmless family vibes. After the meal, I sat at another table to chat to my friend that I had met a few days before. You know those kind of friends you meet on a holiday and you never see them again. And we just had a laugh and then took turns on my Nintendo DS for a bit. At the back of the room near the bar and exit, there was a practical joke shop and my friend and I went over to have a browse. We didn't end up buying anything and as we left, he said that he was going to the toilet and I waited. Bear in mind, this was a fairly busy large room with a mini shop, bar, and stage. I was waiting there, minding my business, and I distinctly remember a bunch of women, dressed all in pink, entering and buying drinks as I was waiting for my friend, which I now understand would have been a hen party. Just one of those weird insignificant things you distinctly remember while something happens when you were younger. While I am waiting, I feel a tap on my shoulder and turn around to see a man in his mid to late twenties smiling at me. He said, Hey, I'm the manager here. Your family have gone back to the apartment in a hurry and asked me to drop you off. Come with me. Being eight years old, you would have a tendency to listen to anyone older and seemingly friendly, but it struck me as odd as he didn't have a uniform or badge or anything like that. And I thank my lucky stars that I had the streetwise to say something like, I'm just waiting for my friend in the toilet and his mom will take me back. Now... I reckon I was too much trouble for him as he just strangely looked at me for a bit and swiftly left the room. Just as he did, my friend came out and as strange as this sounds, I just brushed it off and forgot about it. And even as I came back to my table and saw my family there, I didn't say anything. I wasn't particularly frightened or spooked that night. The next day on the beach, I remember just sitting there thinking about it. It is something that has stuck with me ever since, and as I grew up it dawned on me how dangerous it was. What if I went with a man? Looking back with hindsight, this was the mid-2000s in a cheap UK holiday park with little security and the car park was right next to the exit. 
I really should have told my parents so we could alert the staff. As for all I know, the man could have tried this the next night on another kid. I know now the man was most likely a pedophile or a predator and it chills me to think that these types of people can get in too and hang around family resorts such as Butlins and Pontins. I hope things have changed now and the security has improved. I know this tale isn't as extraordinary or dramatic as others, but I have always been more scared by the sinister, slightly unnerving stories in life. Has anyone else experienced anything similar? Story by you slash Brittany P. DeLuca I'm a 23-year-old female, and this happened when I was around 12 years old. I was potentially almost kidnapped. I was sitting in my living room, which has a large window, facing the main road, when I heard someone knock on the door in the mudroom. It was attached to the living room. My dad was downstairs playing on his drum set, and it was well into the evening. I thought it was strange, but figured maybe it was someone who wanted to ask him to play a little bit quieter. We got many noise complaints over the years. When I opened the main door, there was a man, probably in his 40s or 50s, wearing what looked like casual business clothes, jeans, black shoes, and a button-up. He was standing there, and I definitely didn't recognize him. I didn't really think much of it, but I kept the screen door closed as a precaution. And here's how I vaguely remember our encounter playing out. He said, Hi, I was wondering if I could use your phone. I need to call someone. I said, Uh, sorry, we don't have a landline and I don't have a cell phone. Of course I lied because I had a bad gut feeling. He said, Oh, that's okay. Do you think I could at least have a glass of water? I can wait here while you grab it. And I answered, Sorry, we just moved in and haven't unpacked our glasses yet. Again, this was a huge lie but I was panicked and through the window, you could clearly see that we had lived there for some time. The creepy dude was trying too hard to be friendly, he then said, That's alright. Do you have a hose that I could drink from? And me, who was definitely freaked out, said, Uh, yeah, it's actually right there on the ground. And then I point to the outdoor hose a couple feet from the door. The creepy dude, with an even wider smile, said, Oh, thank you. Do you think you could turn it on for me? And me, feeling absolutely terrified, said, Uh, sorry, no, I don't know how it works. The dude was visibly a bit angry, but he was trying to hide it. He said, Ah, oh, come on, you don't know how to use a hose? At this point, my fight or flight was in full force, so I just slammed the door. I locked it and then ran downstairs to my dad. I told him what happened and he stormed outside with a baseball bat. But the guy was gone by the time my dad got outside and I never saw him again after that. It still freaks me out to think of what he might have done if he got a hold of me. So creepy dude who showed up at my house and tried to get me outside to turn on the hose. Let's not meet again. And here are the top comments for my last video. Welcome to Miss Creepy Tales Riddle Time. If you know the answer, feel free to leave it in the comments. 
and the winner gets to be featured in the next video. A ghost bought a house. It has all the usual rooms, except for one. What room won't you find? Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you can also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember... Your fear feeds me.